Welcome to a convocation sponsored by the UU Multiracial Unity Action Council. We abbreviate our long name to uh, UUMUAC and pronounce it UMIAC because UMUAC is kind of hard to say. If you've got me about, this is the prize, this is the goal, this is. This is the prize in which we try to keep our eyes, the unity of the light and dark skinned people of the world, and in particular, multiracial unity in the United States and multiracial unity in our congregations. Our mission is, it's a simple one. It's, it's to provide primarily uh, you use with sensible advice on issues of racial justice and our, there's nothing really very complicated about our advice, it's to follow the playbook of MLK Jr. and to, and to uh, adhere to the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism. Um, uh, come to be seen as an op oppositional group by national UU officials because they have a different strategy for promoting racial unity and, and we think it's wrongheaded. We think that it can only lead to um, a worse, a worse arrangement between the races. And uh, our convocation today is about free speech because they're not interested in even discussing it or discussing much of anything else. Uh, I'm Richard Trudeau, I'm the chair, I'm a semi-retired minister. I, I was a math professor for 35 years and then I became a UU minister and did both for 13 years and Retired, served, served two churches over 20 years and retired 10 years ago, but I've been very active since as a, a guest preacher in my part of the world, which is southeastern Massachusetts. And, um, and I'm very much involved in the Unitarian Church in Fall River, Massachusetts. Here's the program today. Uh, it looks like five sessions. It looks like it may take a long time, but, but we're determined to get these five sessions done in an hour or less, and then to have at least a half an hour of discussion with those who are still with us and, and have things to share. And uh, the very first session, as you can see, is by um, Matthew Shear. So let me just say a little bit about him. He's a a doctor of optometry, and he's a behavioral optometrist. His particular interest is in the effects of mispercep misperception on our understanding of ourselves and the world and how that affects our behaviors. And for about 15 or 16 years now, he has become more and more active as a, a lay minister. So I give you uh, Dr. Matthew Shear. You're muted, Matthew. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I'm going to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and the beloved community. Um, and I will start by saying that one of my favorite readings in the gray Unitarian Universalist hymnal is number 565, which is titled Prophets. It's the words of Universalist minister Clinton Lee Scott and begins with, always it is easier to pay homage to prophets than to heed the direction of their vision. Now, I ask you to consider these words by UUA President Susan Frederick Gray that begin an article by her that appeared in the fall 2021 issue of UU World, the denominational magazine published by the Unitarian Universalist Association. This is what she said. The most profound theological gift I received from Unitarian Universalism is the belief in and the commitment to beloved community. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. described beloved community as one of unconditional love, which seeks the fullest unfolding of the personality of every person. Now, a few paragraphs later, she also wrote this. Our faith as Unitarian Universalists 
calls us to respond to our fundamental interdependence by nurturing equity, compassion, and justice across the threads that connect us. Uh, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Uh, I certainly consider the fullest unfolding of every person to be at the heart of what liberal religion should be about. And who's opposed to love and nurturing? But other words of hers that follow each of those passages have raised some concerns for me. She wrote, in the beloved community, racism, poverty, and discrimination would not be tolerated and would instead be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of kinship. And she also wrote, our lives are indelibly woven together. This means that we have a responsibility to each other. And when we allow racism, greed, exploitation, or neglect to define and defile our relationships, suffering thrives. Not tolerated. Is this also what Dr. King said? Is not allowing racism heeding the direction of his vision? I think that's a question worth examining, and that's what I'm going to spend the next five or so minutes doing. Much writing coming out of the UUA describes the beloved community as anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural. Well, what did King himself say? We can go back to the time of the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott, in, which began in December 1955 in response to the arrest of Rosa Parks for not giving up her seat on a bus to a white man. It made a national figure of Martin Luther King Jr. And following its successful conclusion the following December, he received many invitations to speak, including at Oberlin College on February 7, 1957, and UC Berkeley on June 4th, 1957. King's speeches during that period were rather similar, touting the reasons for the success of the nonviolent protest in Montgomery. The Berkeley speech was titled, The Power of Nonviolence. He began by saying that it wasn't easy getting people on board with a nonviolent form of protest, which he explained, quote, is non-aggressive physically, but strongly aggressive spiritually, end quote. Then he said this, another thing we had to get over was the fact that not the nonviolent resistor does not seek to humiliate or defeat the opponent, but to win his friendship and understanding. This was always a cry that we had to set before people that our aim is not to defeat the white community, not to humiliate the white community, but to win the friendship of all of the persons who had penetrated this system in the that may be perpetrate, perpetrated the system in the past. The aftermath of violence is bitterness. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation and the creation of a beloved community. King went on to say, nonviolent resistance is also an internal matter. It not only avoids external physical violence, but also internal violence of the spirit. And so at the center of our movement stood the philosophy of love. King was specific about what he meant by that, not erotic or brotherly love, but that form of love that in Greek is called agape, which in this speech he talked of as, quote, understanding, redemptive goodwill for all. It is an overflowing love that seeks nothing in return, end quote. To me, that stands in stark contrast to concepts of accountability that are being woven into the proposed revisions of the UUA bylaws. It is also worth noting that Dr. King did not invent the term beloved community. That honor goes to the philosopher Josiah Royce, who taught at Harvard from 1882. He replaced William James, by the way, until his death in 1916. King studied Royce in his coursework for his PhD at Boston University in the early 1950s. Royce wrote of beloved community before the term agape gained wide understanding and appeal in this country, but he did talk of a word he used, loyalty. I don't know why I'm using air quotes. He spoke of loyalty in a way similar to uh, agape. He said, by loyalty, I mean the practically devoted love of an individual for a community. Royce said that community has a value which is superior to all the values and interests of detached individuals. And he went on to define 
a community of the loyal quite broadly, ideally, in his words, identifying that community with all mankind. And he said, the principle of principles in Christian morals remains this, since you cannot find the universal and beloved community created. Dr. King's use of beloved community stands, I think, as a stellar example of what in Unitarian Universalism we would call the living tradition. And I see reflections of Royce's concept of devoted, devoted love for an inclusive and increasingly universal community in King's I Have a Dream speech, which he gave at the March on Washington in 1963, as well as the integrated civil rights campaigns that followed in 1964 and 1965. And even though two years after those successes, King himself would declare some of the old optimism was a little superficial, and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. He also said, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. I still have faith in the future. Martin Luther King's belief in and commitment to beloved community is indeed a profound gift. He never gave up on his vision of the beloved community. We should keep in mind Clinton Lee Scott's advice to heed the direction of that vision. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Next, speaking about his Aunt Emma's vision of the beloved community is the founder of UMIAC, the Reverend Dr. Finley Campbell. Let me say a little bit about him. He, he graduated from Morehouse College, went to Atlanta University, got a PhD from the University of Chicago, focusing on socio-political themes in Anglo-American literature. For about 50 years off and on, he was a professor at various colleges, teaching functional composition, Anglo-American literature, and black studies. He's an ordained Baptist minister, but has a long career preaching in Christian and UU congregations. And here I, I give you Dr. Finley Campbell. Thank you, my brother. I hope I'm unmuted. My aunt Emmy's vision of the beloved community, 10 minutes. So give me a nine minute warning when I get to my 10th minute. Here's the background to this homily. We are living again in challenging times. And I'd like to indicate that one of the people that has inspired me to deal with these challenging times died recently. Her name was Kenny James. She was a black professional woman and a very committed UU. And one of the founders of MAC, one of the uh, un unknown founders of our organization, what we used to call the caucus days. Sometimes I wake up in the morning to listen to my favorite news stations, WBZ, RT, dot com WBBM and today's news item is Gaza the ongoing martyrdom of our brothers and sisters in Gaza challenging times and they keep peace peace they keep saying and of course as the prophet once pro prophesied woe to those who cry peace for there is no peace the purpose of this homily is to present an argument about the need for Aunt Emmy's vision of the beloved community that that vision become our vision, rooted in our hearts. Uh, another word in the, from the Greek is quanonia, uh, another name for the uh, beloved community. My thesis is that the beloved community is simply the return of the period of Neolithic communism, 100,000 years of human existence, where through trial and error, through our animal ancestry, uh, we reached a discovery that there were three great powers shaping uh, ability of societies to move forward. Unfortunately, we lived the principles of that time, but we didn't simply understand them through what we call dialectical interaction, fancy word for chance and necessity, interacting, combining evolution with revolution over these 10,000 years we have reached what is called terminology, a vision based upon my discussions with her as a callow youth uh, of 50, of which I call the Marxist Leninist historical theism, driven by a teleological imperative 
that in her tradition, she called God. Who was on Emmy? She was a middle class woman who was forced by marital circumstances to become a worker. She used to be a manager of buildings and then through contradictions I want to describe, ended up acting as a nurse's assistant and then a chief nurse's assistant at Harper Hospital. She, would, she was one of those folks that is pushed by capitalist economic situations from the middle class into the, winking, uh, the working class. In our conversation, she uh, as part of the, she joined the union uh, at the time and they had scholarship for leaders in the union to go to Wayne State University, uh, UAW, United Auto Workers. And she took some courses in workers' history. And she took a course from one of my friends, Dr. Paul Spoon, member of the Progressive Labor Party, on the role of Marxism, Marxism and Leninism in trade union uh, struggles, uh, particularly the CIO. Uh, what she saw was that as she took these courses and she was very religious, a leader at the Baptist church where I was ordained, Russell Street, that there was a prophetic tradition in the Bible that was not being preached by traditional Baptist ministry. Uh, this prophetic tradition, she said, she saw as she learned and be developed in her own way that the Bible, as she said to me in our debates, was a history of class struggle during the period of slavitalism, my word, not hers. Slavitalism, a period of time when the economic system was based on slavery combined with what were called the plebeians. And she said from Genesis to Revolu uh, Revelation, and she said, you should call it the book of revolution, is this working out of class struggle. And of course she knew from her Bible teaching that our church, there were two traditions in the Bible, the prophetic tradition, that's constantly criticizing Israel for failing to live up to its 10 principles, the 10 commandments, and the priestly tradition, whose job it was to maintain the status quo and to say, oh, all things are fixed. God has ordained it. Some shall be rich and some shall be poor. I argued with her and she sort of agreed reluctantly that the Garden of Eden narrative is about Neolithic communism before the fall. That is the description of the kind of world were the two great tribes at the time, the nomadic tribes and the agricultural tribes, symbolized by the two brothers, worked together as one, as one family. And that the principles that, come, come, that shaped that reality, that shaped that reality was community participation and cooperation. What I discovered in her vision was what it traditionally called, and this is a big fancy word, but it's okay, Christian apocalypticism, Christian apocalypticism, apocalypticism, the idea of God constantly wrecking existing structures and preparing the way for a new one. And for her, the book of Revelation or the book of Revolution should be seen as the fulfillment of this great prophetic vision, this battle between the priests and the prophets for the traditional return at a higher level from fragments of the community, fragments of cooperation, fragments of participation to a full total society based upon those things. As we should, as we said together, uh, when we were discussing this stuff, the quanonia made uh, flesh. So under our reality today, this vision is encapsulated in our seven uh, principles. Our seven principles in their own way are trying to wrestle with this question of how do these old values, these true values, these values that make us human, uh, give us power. Her vision is based upon the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, of course, and it says in so many words, must only must you have a political and ideological understanding of the need for the beloved community, but it must be moral, must be spiritual, must be theological. That is why I initially retired from my secular involvement in revolutionary communism to my more recent commitment to these theological forms that I found in Unitarian Universalism. These great principles of the Neolithic communist 
period, cooperation, participation in community. But now we fully understand that these are not just some, some, some people coming together and they don't know what they're doing, they're just doing it. Having these festivals at Stonehenge and dancing with wine and drink as the two tribes come together as one to share a sense of their community. That we, what we now understand is not just uh, something you do, it is actually a principle. It is a principle that is foundational to what we mean by human nature as biosocial, biosocial drives. More studies there being made. Now there's the, again, there's the two traditions. The prophetic tradition in science is always describing how human beings can move forward, can become better, can develop, and that the basis of our lives is these communal value systems. The prophetic tradition in science, oh, no, 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 hardwired, genetic, physically impossible to change. Uh, some people said, uh, Hobbes, I believe he was, he said, man in a state of nature, man during the period of the Neolithic columns was a brutish, nasty, and short. And we simply replayed it over and over again, going round in circles. My Aunt Emmy, because of her belief in the Bible as an evolving reality, ending with the Book of Revolution, saw it as spirals, spirals going from lower levels to higher levels, lower levels to higher levels, until now we have reached where we are today. Everything is in place to create the beloved community. Communications are international. My brother, John Eckrock is coming in from, I guess somewhere in France. I'm here up here in uh, Wisconsin. We're all linked together. What's the problem? Racism. Racism is the problem. I mean, I can, we, can, we can always come up with some other kinds of problems. Nine minutes, racism nine racism. minutes, Finley, nine minutes. Conclusions, so then we'll go to conclusion. 2024, we go to our last GA, all illusions slowly being smashed. Hmm. And here I quote from my brother, Martin Luther King Jr. Given my health situation, I may not get there with you. I may not get there with you, but the work will go on. Those of us committed to building UBIAC as a mass organization greater than the NAACP because we will be going beyond colored people. Greater than SNCC, because we'll have more people than just students. Greater than SCLC, I hope you know what these initials are. If not, I'll tell you about them later. Because we have more than ministers. I will be there in spirit. In the spirit of my beloved Aunt Emmy, a working class prophetess of the beloved community as a historical, not mystical reality. Thank you. And amen. Thank you. I get to do the next, whoops, excuse me. Sorry, I forgot to share the screen. I'm doing the next two segments and uh, I promise that together there'll be no more than 20 minutes. They. The first one may be longer than 10, but then the second one will be shorter than 10. My topic is the meaning of love in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Here's love in the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's from the book of Leviticus in uh, what Christians call the Old Testament, the, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, chapter 19, verse 18, the second part of verse 18. That's what the B is about. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is, this, is, this is the second great commandment according to Jesus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus was uh, composed probably about 600 years before Jesus, 600 BC. I'd like to go back further to the beginning of Israelite religion. So I'd like to go back to 1200 BC. That's when the Israelite people first appear in the archaeological record. They appear in tiny villages on hilltops in central Canaan. And by Canaan, I mean a geographical area. We, we call it Palestine today. Tiny villages. I'll show you a picture of one. This is a view from the air 
of a village called Ai. AI, AI here doesn't mean artificial intelligence. It's the name of a village. Uh, they're just ruins there now, but no one has lived there for a thousand years. But in 1200 BC or so, uh, a new people settled this hilltop and constructed a village. And archaeologists say they were the original Israelites. Um, why were they up in the hills? Well, because they could get away from the kings and their armies who controlled the fertile valleys in Canaan. They were up there for freedom. It was hard to make a living up there, though. The soil was thin. The rain only came during the rainy season, which was mostly the winter and early spring. Then the sun just came out and baked for eight months. The uh, rains, uh, when they were heavy, tended to wash the soil down the hillsides. Uh, there's no springs up there. There are no ponds, of course, or, or brooks. Uh, they had to build cisterns, underground water tanks, to conserve the water that came during the rainy season. They had to terrace the hillsides, that is, transform the hillsides into shelves, basically, so they could grow their crops. Now, both the building of the cisterns and the construction and maintenance of the terraces required a lot of labor, but there were only 150 people so in this village and maybe only 40 people with the youth and vigor to do this kind of hard work. They raised sheep uh, for wool mostly, but occasionally meat. They raised goats for milk and yogurt and cheese. And they grew grapes and figs and dates and a few other crops, but mostly grapes and figs and dates because these things could be stored and get them through, through the winter. If you find this at all interesting, there's a book called who were the early Israelites and where did they come from? Whose title I put there at the bottom. William Deaver uh, was a biblical scholar and an archaeologist who wrote some just wonderful books on, on the beginnings of ancient Israel. Um, in the book of Exodus today, there is a very old law code the biblical scholars call it the covenant code and it, it's it's more than one chapter of exodus it's a list of very particular laws the, these laws are older than the ten commandments which are kind of general principles that were extracted from these particular law, laws later and i'd like to focus on this particular one when you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey going astray you shall bring it back. You're th I'm, I'm going to assume that everybody's a man here because these societies were patriarchal. And even though, of course, women had a lot of influence behind the scenes, the, explicitly it's all, it's all men. Suppose you're a man, you're a farmer in one of these tiny villages. You're on the edge of ecological disaster. The, the village is, is tiny. People need to cooperate. It's just absolutely necessary for, for there to be cooperation or the, the material welfare of, of the village itself is, is put in great danger. You see your, one of your enemy's draft animals, either his ox or his donkey, and it's wandering off and your enemy. This is a guy that uh, has probably bawled out one of your children in a way that you thought was inappropriate or he's looked at your wife in a way that you don't like, or you don't think he's pulling his weight, or you think he's maybe been dishonest with you. You hate this guy. He's your enemy. You don't trust him. You don't like him. You, you have this opportunity to take revenge on him by just letting his draft animal go astray. But see, that would harm the whole community. The, the community is so so dependent on everyone pulling their weight. This is to endanger the community. So you don't do that. You follow this law. You go to the trouble to chase the animal down and bring it back to your enemy's homestead. What does this have to do with love? Well, before I showed you the love command in Leviticus, but it's only the second part of a verse. Here's the whole verse. 
This is Leviticus 19.18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In many parts of the Bible, the same idea is expressed twice in succession in different words. And I believe this is a case of that. Um, people didn't read scripture then. There were very few copies of scripture and most people couldn't read. People heard scripture read aloud to them. And so uh, if you're hearing something, if you miss a word or a phrase or somebody coughs at the same time, you can't go back and, and reread it and, or you can't you can't replay that part of the tape, right? There's no recording. Um, so in recognition of this, uh, in important parts of, the, of scripture especially, the same thought, the same c concept was expressed twice to give people a chance to get it. And I believe this is a case of that. I believe that any of your people there in the first part is to be understood as meaning exactly the same thing as your neighbor in the second part. And I believe that you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge in the first part is to be understood to mean you shall love as yourself in the second part. I think this is the core meaning of love in the Judeo-Christian tradition. If I'm right, that means that this this peculiar little law about bringing your enemy's ox back, this is saying love your enemy. People say that love your enemy is a, an original expression with Jesus. I don't think so. I think the concept is here. You come upon your enemy's dox, ox or donkey going astray, but you're not going to seek vengeance on this person. You're going to bring it back. This is, this is loving your enemy. This is loving your enemy. I was interested in, in Matthew referring just a minute ago to Martin Luther King's expression that love means um, in part um, an absence of internal violence of the spirit. In other words, an absence of taking vengeance or bearing a grudge. Bearing a grudge, that's the, taking vengeance is the external uh, violence, but bearing a grudge is the internal. Okay, that's, that's here. That's here. So that's what I have to say about the meaning of love in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, what does that have to do with uh, open discussion and honest sharing? Just a minute when I can get uh, these little things to get out of my way. There, I can stop sharing. Um, in those little villages, everybody was in the same boat, and more and more, of course, we realize that's true for all of humanity. I, I, I think uh, this, this ethic applies 100% today. In one of those little villages, you had to allow your enemy to speak when there was a village gathering, which of course would have meant a gathering of the men, though the men would have been given instructions behind the scenes by the women, I'm sure. When, when there was a village gathering, you couldn't take any step to prevent your enemy from speaking because your enemy, no matter how obnoxious this guy is, he may have an idea on a way of repairing a cistern by which the repair will last longer than the way cisterns have been repaired. Or he may have an improved idea on repairing or constructing one of these terraces. Uh, if, if, you, if you don't allow your enemy to speak, you're just being stupid. You're putting the whole community in danger. And I think that's what you, you national officials are doing when they censor free speech in our denomination, which they've been doing right and left now for several years, more and more intensively, they're putting the whole Unitarian Universalist community in danger. Doing what they're doing is just stupid. Stupid in the sense of counterproductive.
counterproductive, uh, self-damaging. It's, it's just stupid. And then I also talked about the, in, in my topic here, my second topic, um, the value of honest sharing. Now I'm thinking of community in a different sense. I'm thinking of the UU Ministers Association. I am a member of the UU Ministers Association, a member in good standing, and I attend chapter meetings. It kind of stuns me that I'm still a member in good standing, but I am. Um, and the UU Ministers Association, besides being a kind of minister's union, used to emphasize primarily education when, when uh, there were meetings. The, 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 the important point was to, to educate ministers in, in about something, in some, some issue, some theological approach, whatever. Education. Uh, Melissa Carville Zemer, who's the um, basically executive director of the UU Ministers Association, at a chapter meeting at which I was in attendance, said that the, uh, the leaders now have decided to de-emphasize ed education and emphasize instead community. The Ministers Association is supposed to be a community, a supportive, loving community of colleagues. And I said to her in the question and answer period at the end, uh, Melissa, if I'm going to be a member of a community in this sense, I have to be able to be honest with my colleagues. I have to tell them what I really think and what I really feel. But I can't do that. I'm afraid, Melissa. I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of what the uh, National Board of Directors will do. Uh, I can't. This is destructive of community. And uh, she didn't answer the question, and she ended the question and answer period and ended the meeting. So ended her participation in the meeting. So that was that. But uh, I want to tell you, that's what it feels like to attend a UU chapter meeting. In, um, it feels like East Germany before the fall of communism. In East Germany before the fall of communism, there was a secret police called Stasi, S-T-A-A-S-I. -A -A -S I don't know what that stands for, but it, I know that's the acronym. And Stasi had hundreds of thousands of inform, uh, informants. And in any group, if, if you were in a group of more than three or four people, and even then they had to be three or four people that you knew very well, if you were in any group of people larger than that, a group of, of 12 or 20 or 25 people, a group about the size of a minister's chapter meeting, you really had to watch what you said because there was a significant chance that someone in the room was an informer for the secret police. And that's what uh, UU ministers meetings are like today. And uh, this is nuts. This is nuts. Uh, for this kind of community, you need honest sharing, sharing of thoughts, sharing of feelings. And that's what I had to say. That's what I have to say on my, my second. And so we're up to the third and, and final before we have, we have conversation. Um, there's, there's one more thing on, on the uh, agenda, and it was that Beverly Cease was going to read some excerpts from um, a famous speech by Frederick Douglass. I don't think Beverly Cease is here, though. So I think you're going to wind up having to listen to me some more. I'll read it instead. You've heard this before if you attend our third Wednesday services, but it's, it's just lovely. We have a civil rights hero, maybe our greatest civil rights hero, He's, he and King are one and two anyway, let's put it that way. I don't know who's one or who's two. Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave, speaking at the Music Hall in Boston on December 9th, 1860. He escaped slavery at age 20. He's now 42 years old. He's now living in Rochester. He's the uh, publisher of his own newspaper, The North Star. He's very well respected in anti-slavery circles. And this is not his whole speech, but, but just a, a few excerpts from it. And I think nothing could be more appropriate than that we're discussing freedom of speech. This is a black man talking. 
and talking in Boston, in Boston, the headquarters of the UUA and the UUMA. So here's Frederick Douglass, right on the eve of the Civil War. He said, we thought the principle of free speech was an accomplished fact. Here in Boston, if nowhere else, we thought that the right of the people to assemble and to express their opinion was secure. Dr. Channing, meaning William Ellery Channing, the Unitarian minister, had defended the right. Mr. Garrison had, meaning William Lloyd Garrison, the head of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. They had asserted the right and Reverend Theodore Parker had maintained it with steadiness and fidelity to the last. And the reference to the last means that Theodore Parker had, had died about six months earlier. But here we are today contending for what we thought we gained years ago. Last Monday, a meeting assembled to discuss the question, how shall slavery be abolished? The world knows that that meeting was invaded, insulted, captured by a mob of gentlemen, and thereafter broken up and dispersed by the order of the mayor, who refused to protect the meeting, though called upon to do so. The leaders of the mob were gentlemen. They were men who pride themselves upon their respect for law and order. These gentlemen brought their respect for law and order with them and proclaimed it loudly while in the very act of breaking the law. Theirs was the law of slavery, the law of free speech and the law for the protection of public meetings they trampled underfoot while they greatly magnified the law of slavery. No right was deemed by the fathers of our government more sacred than the right of speech. It was in their eyes, as in the eyes of all thoughtful men, the great moral renovator of society and government. I, I love that phrase, the great moral renovator of society. Daniel Webster, referring to the one-time congressman from New Hampshire and then senator from Massachusetts, Daniel Webster called it a homebred right, a fireside privilege. Liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. That of all rights is the dread of tyrants. It is the right which they first of all strike down. They know its power. We are told that the meeting I referred to was ill-timed and the parties to it unwise. Has Boston yet to learn that the time to assert a right is the time when the right itself is called in question and that those men of all others to assert it are the men to whom the right has been denied? There can be no right of speech where any man, however lifted up, or however humble, however young, or however old, is overawed by force and compelled to suppress his honest sentiments. Equally clear is the right to hear. To suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those, as, well as those of the speaker it is just as criminal to rob a man of his right to speak and hear as it would be to rob him of his money. I have no doubt that Boston will vindicate this right, but in order to do so, there must be no concessions to the enemy. When a man is allowed to speak because he is rich and powerful, it aggravates the crime of denying the right to the poor and humble. The principle must rest upon its own proper basis. And until the right is accorded to the humblest as freely as to the most exalted citizen, the government of Boston is but an empty name and its freedom a mockery. A man's right to speak does not depend upon where he is born or upon his color. The simple quality of manhood 
is the solid basis for the right, and there let it rest forever. And with that, that's the end of our program. And now, um, if folks would like to talk, um, that's, that's what the remaining time is for. We've scheduled at least another 40 minutes for talking, but if talking needs to continue beyond that, we can extend the meeting beyond that. So I'd like those of you who have things to say to please make use of this raise, raise hand feature that's at the bottom of the screen. Sometimes there's no feature that actually says raised hand. Sometimes there's a feature that says responses, but if you click on that, you get raised hand. And it puts a little yellow hand in your window and brings your window to the very front so I can call on you in the order in which you've uh, raised your hand. Alan. Okay. So, yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, it's probably not a revelation, but uh, the the need for and the right of free speech is not only important um, to, you know, the uh, search for responsible search for truth and meaning, which is where we often connect it, but it's connected with a lot of our other principles. You know, when you're talking about the inherent worth and dignity of every person, if you're not allowing a person to share their views uh, on an equitable basis, you know, uh, trying to stifle them or prevent them from hearing things, you're, <laughs> that's a, a violation of their, their worth and dignity in, in there too. If you're looking for justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, I mean, if, if you're looking for justice and you're not, if you're not going to um, avail people of all the information, <laughs> but just, you know, part of the information, it's a little harder to find the truth and, and to find justice with only part of the story. Uh, so, you know, and if you're looking for, you know, a world community with peace and so forth, you've got to have people have got to be uh, able to, you know, share their views and, and, and discuss things if they're going to avoid, uh, you know, going to war and so forth. And, you know, and then even the interconnected web of all existence, you know, you've got to have um, that ability to, to communicate uh, if you're going to, you know, really have that you know, uh, a, a well-functioning interconnected web. So that's all I have to say, but it just, it connects with a lot of our hmm. principles. So a very key thing. Yes, I, I agree. Thank you. Finley. You're, you're muted, I think, Finley. Can't hear you. In that spirit, I make this comment in my debate with Anemi about this issue, there was communism in Eastern Europe, nor in the U.S. horror. What they had was Soviet socialism, which mutated into Stalinism, and there were pros and cons about the nature of that reality. Communism remains a future project. And one of the things they did during the McCarthy period was to shut down that kind of discourse. The McCarthy period was built firmly on shutting down debate, discussion, and discourse. And if you were guilty of raising these issues in your classroom, my, my favorite high school teacher, Mr. Colborn, was fired and we had to go to jail because he refused to go before the House on American Committee. So censorship is the enemy of truth. It has always been. And as one who's been a victim of it <laughs> over and over again, I can vouch for that they, they try to shut you out, but the truth is like water. You dam it up in one hand, it pops up another. And voila, here we are. Yeah. And, and if I can just stick in a comment here. Um, when the UUA was formed in 1961, the uh, birth certificate of the UUA said that the foundation of our religious community is the free and disciplined search for truth. A free and disciplined search for truth. Dick, go ahead. Absolutely, God, that's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much in alignment with what has just been said. Um, that as many of you know, I'm chose to run for the a position on the UA nominating committee. And this is a key, what we've been talking about is a key reason. Because mm. the nominating committee chooses our future leaders. So I, I point out that 
uh, some leaders and staff are being taught that it's okay <clears throat> to display highly ideological positions on certain issues, such as race and gender. And the result of this is that even principled the criticism may be deemed harmful to be censored or punished with accusations substituting for dialogue. So then I point out my commitment to the, our fourth principle, as we just talked about, free and responsible search for truth and meaning and our fifth principle. So to me, that's really what's at stake here, that our leadership is no longer supporting those principles. They, they, are, they are looking at feelings of harm as somehow more important than, than the truth. And, and whose feelings of harm? They don't address that issue. Certain people are privileged, other people are not. And so I, I, what I'm saying, if many of us need to stand up and say, it's not the feelings that are important, it's the truth that's important that we need to, dis to, to discuss. And the feelings need to adjust to reality. And I've just finished reading a little book that is very good at that, if you haven't heard of it. It's by Mark, Professor Mark Goldblatt. It's called, I Feel, Therefore I Am, The Triumph of Woke Subjectivism. And so that sort of lays out the problem we're facing in physical, phys, uh, philosophical terms. It's what is reality itself? What is truth? What is reality? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, re reality is what I feel it is. Yeah. yeah, that's what he's saying. And that's the problem. <laughs> and that's not reality. And he says, if you, if you treat reality as what feelings, uh, eventually it's going to come back to hit you. You can't escape reality. It may be some kind of, in the worst case, even civiliz civilizational collapse if we don't face reality. Mm -hmm. Uh, or institutional collapse or damage, meanwhile, which is what we're happening, which is what is happening in New York right now. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Uh, um, I, I'm really enjoying the presentations and the uh, and the comments. So I thank everybody for all your contributions here. Um, it, it, one thing I'll add is that it seems to me that we're kind of in a war of percentages on speech. Uh, in my congregation, there is a lot of gaslighting, and yet there is a 70-person dissenters group, so there's some pushback there. Uh, but the, the uh, it, in some churches, the gaslight, well, in mine, really, uh, too, but in, in, in many churches, the gaslighting is, is, is the greatest percentage of the speech, the lies, the gaslighting, the, the uh, kind of the false... Uh, white supremacy culture ideology. Um, and so I think our, our, a big part of our challenge is to uh, make it so that the, the truth, truthful communication and the healthy communication outweighs the lies so that you have the, the balance coming up on the side of truth. Um, and I'm I'm grateful to uh, UMIAC and NAUA and uh, uh, the Fifth Principle Project, all our organizations here that are uh, helping us to really kind of uh, flood the zone with truth and with free speech. So uh, just many thanks <laughs> for that. Thank you, Jack. J Jack is before the Tower of DeKalb, Illinois. There. You're, you're muted, Jack. Okay, good. Well, those were wonderful presentations. I learned something from each of them. And I'm grateful. Uh, I think there's an underlying theme, a kind of connective tissue that runs through each of those five points of view that we just heard. And that is, you might think of it as, uh, what is the content of love? Love is such an ambiguous word, isn't it, in our culture? When, when you say love, you don't really know what someone means, except that uh, it implies a certain strong emotional uh, approval uh, a, um, a positive balance 
for something. Other than that, it, it's rather, it really needs to be defined. And I think the connective tissue that runs through all of these views of practical love, of applied love, of um, love as it functions to build and nurture and strengthen community is um, a complex of emotions that that I would describe as forbearance and patience and sympathy and even agreement. I don't mean that you agree with everything that your opponent in a debate uh, or your enemy in a in a uh, in a, uh, a conflict in an organization believes or says, but rather that you agree with their that they have as much right as you do to hold their view. And if love is to mean anything, it means that we have to respect the right of others who disagree with us to hold their views. Now, it's a little bit, um, it seems to me, uh, uh, what's the word I want? Paradoxical, because it doesn't mean that we have to respect their view. Their view may be, in our opinion, totally wrong, but they have as much right to hold it as we have to hold ours. Uh, otherwise, freedom doesn't mean anything. If, if freedom is to be evaluated by the context in which it, uh, around which it occurs. Am I making sense? So uh, have you had the experience of being in a discussion, say at a congregational meeting, and you state a point of view and other people, some other people immediately erupt with emotional negativity and condemnation. That, that destroys love. That destroys the beloved community. Uh, you may disagree with something that somebody else shares or has to say, but you at least owe the community. You don't so much owe them as you owe the community the position of forbearance, of patiently thinking about what they've said and searching out whether there might be even a nugget of truth or value in what they've said, because nobody ever, ever has the whole truth. And too often in our discussions, even in so-called liberal communities, we don't give each other that, um, that opportunity. We don't we don't, we're not patient enough to consider the merits of the point of view of our opponents. And yet we often learn more from our opponents than we learn from our allies because our allies already agree with us. But our opponents may have some, uh, some uh, points to share that help us to grow, to enlarge us, to take in more than we, than we did before to be open to other points of view. And I think if Unitarians, as well as everybody else, could learn non-defensive communication, being able to listen and uh, respect and um, cherish the contributions of others, we would go a lot farther toward building the kind of community that we want to see, instead of the kind of automatic rejecting this that we're getting now from people like Sarah Scotchko and uh, and their ilk uh, in uh, in the uh, UU crowd. Hmm. Well, that's what I have to say. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Jack. Karen. Yes, hi, everybody, and thank you for the wonderful ideas and words and time and effort. I really enjoy this community a lot. Uh, I'm with the Church of Tampa. I was on the board uh, after our previous minister left. Uh, it seemed to me that she was pretty much hook, line, and sinker UUA all the way, as were the ministers we've interviewed afterwards and tried to hire, especially those who have recently you know, graduated. Um, I won't go into all the details, but a lot of people left at the same time and the congregational meetings at the time were 
shut down if you weren't espousing the, the right viewpoints. Now our meetings, we hear everybody, we have a healthy relations team that is really well done and is in, inculcating a culture of reflective listening that before you speak with your point of view, you reflect back what the other person has said and they get a chance to say whether you got it right or not. Um, we now have a minister who's a retired Methodist minister. Um, I am really concerned that there will ever be another UU minister out there fresh from school that we can afford, you know, um, that will not want to hijack this new culture that that is coming. I say new, but maybe it's a restored culture because some of the folks who are our tall trees actually came back when they saw these good things happening. Um, I am deeply concerned about the keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Cervantes Gomez write up that was shared, I think, uh, through UMIAC and maybe some of the other listservs, trying to figure out what this apophatic um, means, this um, knowing God through the negative or like that whole thing is just truly bothersome to me how a, these keynote speaker is selected on and just that where, where's the hope for the future of ministers in our denomination? I'm sorry if I haven't made much sense and I jump all over the place all the time, but that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Karen. If I could just speak for a second, apophatic means, uh, apophatic theology is when you, you, you talk about God in terms of what God is not rather than in terms of what God is. But there's, it's, it's a, quite a legitimate uh, tradition. There are saints who are known as apophatic, but, but that, that may be apart from other concerns you may have about her presentation. Matt. Yeah, hi, thanks. Just a couple of quick comments that have accumulated. Uh, I, I am enjoying the discussion and the very good points people are raising. <clears throat> um, yeah, I too, I believe, Free speech, I mean, the word disciplined, I think, is more accurate than responsible because responsible can lead us into, you know, oh, well, as uh, incoming UUA president, Sophia Betancourt said, covenant without consequences isn't covenant. And that kind of concerns me a little bit. That's, that's a wrong interpretation of responsible in my mind. Um, I have no issue with the, the most humble sharing what they think, but that does not necessarily mean, at least in my opinion, that their view is well informed. But I think when we show respect to them, we listen to them. Uh, one thing I do with anyone is I say, that's a very interesting point. Uh, how did you come by it? Is there a source you could share with me? And I show them respect uh, uh, to read it. And uh, and after the fifth time around, when I decide it's not worthy, I say, please don't send me anything more from that source. Um, uh, I should point out the number of times that we cited voices that were not from the white community. Uh, the UUA talks about centering voices of the disenfranchised, the oppressed. Yet it seems that no matter how many wise voices from that collective that we cite, they are still somehow swept aside as not being valid, I think perhaps merely because it doesn't fit in with their orthodoxy. Um, I do want, when it comes to things, just as we pronounce uh, U-U-M-U-A-C as UMIAC, even though it's not 100% accurate, I would offer that we should pronounce N-A-U-A as NAWA. It rolls off the tongue pretty good. I'm hoping to get that into common parlance. And as for the the this accumulation of those who are fighting against the current orthodoxy coming out of Farnsworth Street, um, you know, UMIAC, Fifth Principle Project, now uh, Save the Seven Principles, there's perhaps others. I like collectively calling us the resistance. And in this, I kind of have in mind the French resistance during World War II. Um, 
I don't prefer the term rebel forces, even though you might want to think of the Star Wars epic and they're all Jedis and they they buddied up with cute Ewoks. I, I think there is others. Reb, the term rebel can have some negative connotations and we should not hand this to those that oppose us. Um, so uh, that's that pretty much covers everything I wanted to say. Thanks for letting me do this kind of little accumulation of things and I look forward to more conversation. Mm -hmm. John, John is in France, I think. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. It's a shame Stop. you French lost the Eiffel Tower to to um, to Jack. That's yeah. a bad trade. That's, yeah, it's now in DeKalb, Illinois. Yeah. Good to meet you in person. Uh, there would be two, I could speak for about several hours, and I think I will. I can't do that, so I'm, I'm, I won't do that. Uh, there are some things I think that I can I can add. Uh, we had a retreat uh, here in Europe not very long ago of, of Unitarians, and uh, the theme is uh, was uh, what was happening to us. What are we becoming? And uh, we must have been about a, about eighty or ninety in the room. And what I observed was deeply concerning to me, because what I what I heard and what I saw was uh, my fellow Unitarians uh, moving uh, almost unconsciously towards a new sociological uh, center or system of gravity where love takes the center and our old our old our traditional center of, of uh, freedom and and uh, personal thinking and free speech seems to have taken a, um, uh, a back seat. And that happened almost naturally. As I, as I watched the speaker move the, the audience through uh, various stages mm -hmm. in her presentation and the way in which the audience flowed towards her thesis that we should be moving towards love and away from, from free thought or individualism, um, I, I I, I just couldn't help thinking that, that we're in big trouble. Uh, and the conclusion that I came to was that there's something going on that, that, isn't in, that isn't free thought or isn't free speech, that speech and thought do not carry the weight that they used to carry, and that something sociologically and culturally is happening to, uh, to our community. And it's beyond, it's beyond uh, deliberation, it's beyond uh, conversation, and it and it's just seems to be part of a larger uh, community dynamic that escapes, uh, escapes what we can say. And I found that deeply concerning. Uh, I, I think that others can, can, can I hope that I may, I'm, I'm making myself clear. That's no, point number one. Point number two, I was helped uh, a lot by Vernon uh, to form what we call a guide for workshops on democracy in small UU congregations and fellowships. We did it, uh, we tested it, and it works. Um, and it's a small guide that we put together. It was tough putting it together because it's difficult uh, working through the various issues of democracy. And we put it together so that small congregations can explore uh, what democracy is for them and how they can they can improve democracy and and uh, freedom of thought and speech in their uh, in their communities so I wanted to share that with you uh, and the last thing is that here in France this morning um, there was a a major uh, there was a major um, I'm in French, I'm sorry. There, there was a major radio, radio program uh, on France Culture on the subject that we're, uh, we're discussing today on free speech. And the uh, France Culture is our, is our cultural radio station. And the, uh, the center, the, 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 uh, the focus of, of the, uh, or the theme of what was presented was that uh, we had to go back to Socrates, where Socrates died because he insisted on uh, 
when he spoke to speak the truth. And that speaking the truth has been uh, a constant from Socrates to today. And that one of the major problems that we have today is that when we speak, or when many people speak, they don't speak to the truth, but they speak for many other reasons. And that there is a, there is a, um, there is a need, there is a tradition, uh, there's a virtue in trying to find ways when we speak to speak uh, with the intention of saying the truth and only the truth. And that was the, that was what was, uh, that's what the French heard this morning on France Culture. So I wanted to share that with you, which I thought would be relevant to what we're doing today. Mm, thank you. Yes. Julie. Uh, yes, I forgot to mention before there, there is an email list that I, I started about six months ago that uh, it's an international email list. It's got a, a, a view UUs who want to save the seven principles. So it, anybody who would like to save the seven principles is welcome to join if you would like. If you want to join, just send me an email, julie, J-U-L-I-E, at pinefish, P-I-N-E-F-I-S-H dot com. John. Oh, I'm, I've had my I've had my time. No, no, the other John. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, just a quick one. Uh, it's not working. Uh, the UUA uh, churches are going down in number, and even by the UUA standards uh, of churches and fellowships, they add communities there. If you if you checked it out, you'd find the total of communities and covenant groups. Uh, by going UUA statistics, which I put in the chat. And all you have to do is put UUA space statistics, and you'll see that the Sunday school numbers from 61 to, to currently, the most current they have, are down by more than half. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the statement that David Bumble, you may not remember it, but David you're 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 kind of, uh, kind of losing you there, John. Hang on a second. Me in 1960s in Boston, uh, in '61, drove driving from Chicago in David's car, and we were coming into Boston, and David's background was Universalist and mine was Unitarian, uh, and he said, you know, where there's uh, decay, there's merger. And where there's energy, there's schism. So in my point of view on, on you, you. Uh, uh, and, uh, John, John, we're, we're uh, missing a lot of what you're saying, but I think you're saying is that the, the schism that uh, it seems about to you know play uh, a good thing. Uh, that's you know you got but we, but we, I think you we, we we can't hear you, John. It it, it maybe uh, if he were to turn off his video, his bandwidth would be better for audio. Yeah, John, you might want to try that. Let, let okay. let's hear from Molly first. Yeah, go Molly, go ahead. Thank you. I, you know, this has been just a, a marvelous conversation. I love the opportunity that you give us to uh, discuss these things. I, uh, everything that everybody's saying to me is, is, has just further enlightened and I, I hope I contribute something. Um, when I, when I look at um, a lot of what is going on culturally, um, and I know really only in I know mostly I'm in my own environment, of course, and in the greater community that I live in, and less so internationally about what's going on. But, uh, but we've been tremendously, tremendously impacted by technology. And I, I hate to, I don't wanna blame things on technology, but somehow technology changes the whole conversation and who hears it and how they hear it and who gets absorbed into it. And I often think of differences in our society 
as being reflected in the bell curve. And we have the far left, the ultra woke, if you will, and then the far right that's, you know, and politically um, far right, but also in that sort of position. And I often think they're very similar, very, very similar. They both want to shut down opposing views. They want to, um, they, they are, they're worried, they, they talk about free speech, both of them will talk about it and then not practice it. Um, so anyhow, that's just sort of my, my view of it. So I really do still think that in that middle ground, there, in that centrism, in the center, that there's there's a total rejection of those those far edges, and those far edges, due to technology, have a bigger voice, a louder voice, a more, and they have a way of creating that technology to assist them. They create bots, they do this, they do that, and they can make it seem like it's a much bigger voice. Now, how does that have to do with our own experience in our community, in my church, which is small enough that I know everybody in the church, and they know me? Um, but it's so it's it's intoxicating almost to them to have the that that they can get their fringe positions created to so that people are overwhelmed by it. It's like they can reach out to the UUA and the UUA is supporting them in what is just a fringe position. Nothing wrong with a fringe position. Love thy neighbor. Listen to all points of view. It's just that they kind of have a toxic way of infecting others. And I don't know how to handle it at all. It's just my observation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Matt. Yeah. Uh, in re quick response to, to what Molly just said. Um, it, it um, yeah, technology can make a voice seem bigger than it is. Um, in particular, um, certainly here in New England, the culture leans very heavily into if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything, leading people to only hear the voices that speak, which make them feel they have more support than they do. Um, it, it can be tough to say, yeah, I don't really agree with that, especially when someone is a little fragile about that. Um, and uh, just a quick word about democracy. Uh, I've said this in other gatherings here. Um, General Assembly is run like a New England town meeting. And as such, it, it, it's the oldest, purest form of democracy. But unless really there is a much higher percentage of participation, it's actually not democratic at all. It's a matter of packing the house to, to push through what you want. And maybe that's the best we can do, but there used to be more operating, forgive the expression, in good faith, what George Washington called first principles. And I, I think there's been an abandonment of that. That's all, thanks. Hmm, thank you. Finley. You're muted. Uh, yeah, okay. I always want us to bring, come back to the force, the power, of a multifaceted attempt uh, to destroy Unitarian Universalism, to destroy the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. The decision in 1961 to move to the next phase in this evolving reality that Anemi and I discussed was a humanist religion emerging from the womb of historical theism. That humanity would emerge as the voice of the divine, whether apophatic or copophatic or whatever phatic you want, the emphasis would be on humanness. And God would quietly and gently fade away, having done his or her duty over the past 10,000 years. The, the development of such an event sits shockwaves into the traditional anti-humanist forces that were controlling Washington, D.C. at that time. And I'm, like, I'm still doing my research on the impact of FBI involvement and saying, uh-oh, 
is this new group something we can control? Like we're controlling Protestantism and Catholicism. Those are the two main religions back in 61. They use many devices to try to wreck our emerging religious reality. The weapon they came up with was in 67, 68 with the black empowerment movement. So I'm gonna hammer home, hammer home, hammer home. Whatever pain we're feeling, whatever confusion that have been imposed upon us, whatever gaslighting techniques that are being dumped on our laps emerges from a specific cluster of folks I call the Afrocentric neo-racist cabal and their allies. They began as a little small grouping within the UUA with as much power as everybody else. Drum, diverse revolutionary, blah, blah, blah. ARE, Allies for Equality, and UBAC. There were these three groups that were sharing ideas, debates about the nature of racism and how to fight it. But beginning in 2015, uh, led by a dear former friend, whose name I keep forgetting, Cor Coralie Jump Jones or something like that. There was this terrifying shift to the right, pretending to be a shift to the left. So this Afrocentric grouping, slowly, slowly over years of manipulation and guilt tripping and economic drive, money, M-O-N-E-Y, is a force behind a lot of this mess because that was a battle of black empowerment. We want money. Well, they finally got the money and now they want to control everything else. So we must never forget the role of neo-racism that's played in all this confusion. And our staunch opposition from a multiracial Unitarian Universalist perspective is the trigger because we were the one that reached out to Todd. We're the one that reached out to, uh, to our friends in Atlanta, the fifth principle and created this resistance movement. We've done some good work comrades, but never forget who the enemy is, racism. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we should break out with if I had a hammer. <laughs> Closing song. Are we just about finished probably for the day? What do you what do you folks think? I move to adjourn. Yeah. The motion, I'm getting tired. Yeah, okay. Well let, let's do that. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a great day. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Thank you.